Hello, I am Dr. Michael Bycroft. I'm a historian of science and technology. I work in the history department at the University of Warwick. And this talk is going to be about gender in the context of the history of science. What does the history of science have to say about science and gender? The talk, though, is focused less on gender in particular than on a wider topic, on the general relationship between science and society. It's easy to imagine that these are two very different things. On the one hand, we have science. It's a collection of textbooks, of equations, of sophisticated instruments, of extremely bright people. On the other hand, there is society, a motley collection, a messy collection of political parties, social groups, private enterprise, families, uh, idiosyncratic individuals, all with their own peculiar beliefs and peculiar prejudices. On this view, science is a kind of sealed container. On the inside, we have rigor and precision and scientific methods. On the outside is prejudice and bias and motivated reasoning. Now, there's a lot of truth in this picture. One reason universities exist, after all, is precisely to make space for free inquiry, a free and rigorous inquiry. One reason we have, say, double blind reviews is precisely so that we can screen off the biases of reviewers. But this uh, sealed container view of science can also be a misleading picture. It's not just that science, uh, sorry, that society sometimes leaks into science. It's also that science society is always already part of science. Science is done by people and people have interests, they have desires, they have emotions, they have background assumptions, and all of these things don't just suddenly drop away when we enter the laboratory. As one historian of science put it, it is much society inside the laboratory as there is outside it. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. After all, science wouldn't function without interests, without desires, without emotions, without assumptions. At the very least, in order to begin science, in order to get it off, off the ground, we need a bunch of people who desire to do it. So society is as much a feature of science as it is a bug. I'm laboring this point because it helps to clear away one blockage to studying this topic of gender and science. If science really is sealed off from society, then it is sealed off from the question of gender, and in that case, the whole question of the relationship between science and gender becomes a non-question. To see how gender can be bound up with science, it is useful to see how society in general can be bound up with science. Now, these topics have been rather controversial in the recent past. Uh, in the science wars of the 1980s and 1990s, there was a clash between scientists and humanists about just how much trust we should place in science. On the screen, you can see a, a quote that raised the ire of some scientists in the 1980s and which was part of this much wider discussion about the objectivity and value of science. Uh, this is a quote from a book by one of the more radical philosophers of science who have published on science and feminism. It's a reference to the three laws of motion described by Sir Isaac Newton in a book published in 1687. Why is it not as illuminating and honest to refer to Newton's laws as Newton's rape manual as it is to call them Newton's mechanics? So asked Sandra Harding in The Science Question in Feminism. Now this may strike you, and it certainly strikes many people, as an odd claim to make. I'm sure you can think of lots of ways in which Newton's three laws of motion differ from a rape manual. Uh, the claim is slightly less odd when we place it in the context of the argument that Harding was actually making in the book, but even when we place it in the context, it can still be a fairly provocative and perhaps not very convincing claim. And I'm certainly not going to try to convince you that Harding was right. But I do want to show that there is a kernel of truth in this statement. I do want to show that science is shaped by wider society, including by assumptions about gender that prevail in wider society. And I'm going to follow in the footsteps of Sandra Harding by using Isaac Newton as an example to illustrate these points. 
Here's a statue of the great man, Sir Isaac Newton, outside the British Library. You've probably seen it. It depicts Sir Isaac Newton sitting on a plinth and measuring the universe with his dividers. This gives us a particular view about Newton. It's a rather abstract, otherworldly view of the man. He's sitting on that plinth. He's surveying the world from above. He is more like a god than a human being. And this is fairly common in public images of great scientists today. We tend to prefer our scientists to be divine rather than to be worldly. And again, there's a lot of truth in this image, but it can also be very misleading. And it's also an ahistorical image because that's not the way most 17th century scientists saw themselves, including the rise of Newton. Their own image of science was rather more like this. This is the image on the front of the first history of the Royal Society of London published in the 1660s. Note the bust of King Charles II in the centre, who was described very openly as the author and patron of the society. So this is evidently a kind of science which is rooted in patronage, in a steady flow of funds from a powerful individual. It's also a, ver a version of science which is rooted in history. The image on the right is of Francis Bacon, the philosopher who imagined an institu institution like the Royal Society of London several decades before it was created. This is a science which is also rooted in commerce and industry. Note the instruments in the background on the image. There are guns, there are balances, there's navigational equi equipment, there's an architectural model of a tower. Many of the members of the early Royal Society of London uh, were architects or who had connections to the world of architecture. This is also a science which is rooted in books. Note the bookshelf on the left-hand side of the image. It's true that the motto of the Royal Society of London was nullus in verba, that is, take no man's word for it, or think for yourself, or try things out for yourself. Nevertheless, the fellows of the Royal Society couldn't escape from the world of words. Uh, the Royal Society of London had its own library, and that's represented here. Evidently, this is itself an idealised image of the Royal Society of London. The society really lived up to its goal of being useful, at least it didn't in the short term. But at least this image is honest about the fact that science is situated in a wider world. This is true of the Royal Society of London in general, but it's also true of Isaac Newton in particular. Reading his scientific works, his works on celestial mechanics, his works on optics in particular, is like reading any other work from the age, say the plays of William Shakespeare or the diary of Samuel Pepys. All of these works are a reflection of the time and place in which they were composed. Take, for example, Isaac Newton's most famous experiment, the so-called crucial experiment, which showed that white light is made up of rays of coloured lights. This is rightly seen as a fundamental experiment in modern optics, since it turns the received wisdom about light and colour on its head. Before this time, most physicists had followed Aristotle in thinking that it is white light that is somehow primitive or fundamental, and that coloured light is some modification of white light, whereas Newton tells us that the opposite is, is the case. Coloured rays are fundamental and white light is merely a mixture of these coloured rays. The experiment involved passing a ray of white light through two different prisms. The first prism on the left of this diagram separated the light into a spectrum of colours. The second prism refracted just one of those coloured rays of light. Now, diagrams of this experiment usually boil it down to a few straight lines, like the diagram on the screen. It looks a little bit like the kind of diagram you would see in a geometry textbook. These di diagrams omit the fact that Newton did the experiment in a very particular place, namely his room at Trinity College, Cambridge. He was a professor of mathematics at Cambridge at the time. He described his experiment like this. Having darkened my chamber and made a small hole in my window shuts, I let in a convenient quantity of the sun's light, and I placed my prism at its entrance 
that it might thereby be refracted to the opposite wall. This is an age before laboratories. Even the University of Cambridge had no purpose-built space for doing experiments and wouldn't have one for another century or so. So Newton made the most of what was available to him, his window shuts, his own chamber, and the opposite wall onto which he refracted the image of the prison. The result is that it's hard to understand this experiment, it's hard to understand his optics in general without bearing in mind the particular place in which he did them. Another diagram reflects Newton's obsession with alchemy, the art of converting base metals into gold. Newton was a true believer in alchemy, just like many of his contemporaries. Alchemy had not been debunked by the scientific revolution, it was part and parcel of the scientific revolution. The 16th and 17th centuries were the golden age of the practice of alchemy. These were precisely the centuries uh, where the scientific revolution is usually located. Now, the key to alchemy was separating substances into their components and then recombining them, often to make something different, but sometimes to make the same thing, to reproduce the same thing by first dividing it and then recombining its components. So it's no surprise that Newton uses exactly the same process in his work on optics. If white light is made up of coloured light, he reasons, then we should be able to recover white light by combining the different parts of the solar spectrum. And that's exactly what he does in the experiment shown on the slide. He separates white light with uh, one prism, the one on the right of the diagram, and he uses a convex lens to recombine the rays in a second prism. Now that's not just a brilliant science experiment, it's also a brilliant example of alchemical thinking. It's an example of alchemy applied to optics. There's also a sense in which the optics, uh, the great book published in 1704 in which these experiments were described, there's a sense in which this was a theological book. Here's the very last sentence of the book. And no doubt if the worship of false gods had not blinded the heathen, their moral philosophy would have gone farther than to the four cardinal virtues. And instead of teaching the transmigration of souls, that reincarnation, and to worship the sun and the moon and dead heroes. They would have taught us to worship our true author and benefactor as their ancestors did under the government of Noah and his sons before they corrupted themselves. Now this is the last thing you would expect in a book about light and color. Here is a book which is principally about uh, prisms and uh, the solar spectrum and all of a sudden at the end of it, we have a description of false gods, of the heathen, of the transmigration of souls, and of the government of Noah. But all of this was very important to Newton. It wasn't just uh, an afterthought in this book. Newton was an extreme form of Protestant. Earlier Protestants like Luther and Calvin thought that scripture had been corrupted by earlier writers, especially medieval writers and Arabic writers. Newton was more extreme. He thought that the rot had set in much earlier. He thought that the only true religion was that of Adam and Eve. And since then it had been corrupted. Sometimes it had been restored by brilliant individuals like Noah, hence the reference to Noah and his sons here. Um, but the pristine original form of religious knowledge was that of Adam and Eve. Eve. This had dramatic theological consequences. It meant, for example, that Newton believed the very heretical claim that Jesus Christ is not the son of the God, but the son of God. But this was important theologically, but it was also crucial for Newton's own research because it meant that he was very interested in the timeline of human civilization, as two historians have argued in a recent book, Newton and the Origin of Civilization. Newton wanted to know exactly when the knowledge of Adam had been lost, and this was a very complicated technical problem. It wasn't just a matter of reading history books or reading the Bible. It was also a matter of doing what you might call historical astronomy, finding references to rare astronomical events in the history books. You might find a reference to a comet, say, uh, in a book in the Old Testament, or a solar eclipse in the New Testament. 
you would then use the laws of astronomy to determine the precise year in which that astronomical event had occurred, and you could thereby infer the year in which some biblical event had occurred. Historical astronomy was also a matter of reconciling many different calculations, which often gave different results. As a result, Newton had to invent new forms of error analysis to deal with these discrepancies. Prior to this, most astronomers and physicists, when they had a series of discrepant measurements, they would simply select the one that uh, they thought was most reliable, or uh, in many cases, the one that was most convenient for their argument. Newton adopts a different approach in his work on historical astronomy. He tries to average out uh, the different measurements he makes, and often this averaging was a complicated technical procedure. So this is a massive technical project that Newton was deadly serious about, and that it is impossible to understand except in the context of his age. So Newton's scientific works may not have been a rape manual, but they were certainly a mirror of the time and place in which he lived. But what about gender? Where does gender fit into the story of Newton, science and society? <clears throat> The key point here, I think, is that gender is just like theology or alchemy or architecture. It was a pervasive part of society and therefore it was bound to find its way into science in some way or another. This gendering of science is partly a matter of exclusion and inclusion. Membership of key scientific institutions. So the first female member of the Royal Society of London was admitted in 1945. Uh, the Royal Society of London is slightly better than Cambridge University, which first allowed women to take four degrees in 1947. They both did much better than the Paris Academy of Sciences, whose first female member was admitted in 1979. So this is partly a matter of exclusion and inclusion, but behind these data points, there's also a long history of speculation about the gendered nature of the mind usually done by men and usually to the detriment of women. Women were excluded from these institutions for the same reason they were excluded from, say, running marathons. They were thought to be the weaker sex. For their own good, they should be shielded from vigorous activities like running long distances or solving complicated e equations. It's tempting to think that these views disappeared with the Enlightenment, at least among educated men, but even the most advanced thinkers at the very end of the 18th century had a blind spot with regards to gender. Here's a quote from the, from the French philosopher Condorcet in his great book, his sketch of the progress of the, of the human mind from 1795. Inequality between the rights of men and women has no other origin except the abuse of power and it is in vain that people have tried to excuse it with sophisms. Condorcet states this a few pages, pages later, we find him qualifying this somewhat. Woman cannot rise to the same heights as extraordinary men. There could never be a female Euler or a female Voltaire, though there could be a female Pascal or Rousseau. Of course, these beliefs did not stop women from making major contributions to the sciences, but usually they did so in a way that was constrained by their gender. A classic example is Marie-Anne Lavoisier, the French uh, wife of the chemist Antoine Laurent Lavoisier. Marie-Anne was a key player in Lavoisier's scientific work as a translator, as a publicist, as an illustrator, a note taker, a facilitator of scientific debates. Most of the really interesting scientific debates that happened at the Paris Academy of Sciences in the late 18th century didn't take place at the formal meetings of the Academy. They often took place elsewhere, and one of those venues was uh, the domestic home of the Lavoisiers, and these meetings were presided over by Marie-Anne Lavoisier. The image on the screen shows two of her roles. This is a drawing that was made by Marie-Anne to illustrate one of Lavoisier's published works. And it also depicts Marie-Anne herself in her role as a note taker for this experiment. <clears throat> 
These were all crucial roles, but they were also seen as women's roles. Handwriting and drawing, for example, were seen as key elements of a woman's education in this period. So women were gendered even when they were included in scientific work. And of course, men were gendered too. It's significant that the subject of this experiment is a man, the person wearing the mask and breathing into the tube in the center of the image is a man. Uh, and the reason for this is that Lavoisier was interested in the scientific management of manual labor. This is an experiment to measure the ability of people to respire when they're performing hard work. And of course, Lavoisier was writing at a time when manual labor was associated with men. You're going to hear a lot more about the gendering of scientific practice in the rest of this module. The aim of this lecture has been a little different, to get you thinking about the ways that science is shaped by society in general, with a couple of illustrations uh, from Isaac Newton's works and some hints about the way that gender has shaped the practice of science for the last couple of centuries. Now, my examples have been historical ones, and you might think that they are therefore irrelevant. And yet our image of science continues to be shaped by past science, as the statue of Isaac Newton at the British Library shows. And we should be careful about judging the past because one day we will be judged by the future. The 17th century may seem naive and unjust to us, but it did not seem that way at the time. Alchemy seemed natural, so did excluding women from the Royal Society of London. Likewise, much of what we do today in science seems natural, it doesn't seem naive and unjust, but we need to think about how it will appear to historians in a hundred years' time. Thank you for your attention.